Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me for this talk. Uh, this will actually be the first time that it is recorded for certain reasons that I will discuss during the talk. To give you a little bit of an idea of who I am and some of my background, I do a lot of cyber warfare advisement for various governments and parliaments around the world. As a matter of fact, on Monday, I will have a 12-hour layover in Paris, not really, I don't like Paris, uh, for a cyber crisis workshop with NATO and celebrating the 70th anniversary of NATO uh, this year. Uh, my background is in a lot of IT, IoT, and especially in ICS SCADA systems, and I've been doing it for quite some time, starting with the United States Air Force Space Command, where we had to deal a lot with all sorts of industrial control systems and control systems with satellites, and also because it was part of the U.S. military, we had a very high uh, threat risk profile from all sorts of people, and satellite systems are not usually the most secure things, even to this day. The majority of them do not have any encryption. Luckily, the Air Force brought me in because, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, when I was a 10-year-old, I kind of got into a bit of trouble uh, because I was caught breaking into the Department of Justice, and for eight years, I was not permitted to use any sort of electronics until the U.S. Air Force took me in at the age of 18. So. This talk, it's very interesting. Uh, it's not your, say, typical hacker talk because it's dealing with in incident response, uh, dealing with an actual case of cyber terrorism. Now, what had happened was in the year 2014, the Royal Saudi Arabian Embassy in The Hague in the Netherlands was hacked. And it was quite an interesting day when they contacted me because I was in the middle of eating lunch and I, uh, I, I think I was eating spinach because it was all in my mouth and a very large gentleman in a very nice suit came to get me and uh, usually that's not a good sign uh, but uh, I asked the individual, hey, what, what's going on? And he said, hey, I, I'm, I'm not at that particular pay grade to actually know what's going on, but I have to summon you. There's been a problem. And I was quickly briefed by my management and in contact with the uh, security services and so forth of Saudi Arabia. And it turns out that the email account for the official business email for the embassy had been broken into. So they immediately brought me to the embassy and because this looked like it was an incident, I brought my forensics expert with me uh, because we had to figure out what was going on. Now, this particular incident actually spread out from the embassy. It involved over 20 different embassies in The Hague. It also involved the diplomatic police of the Netherlands. The Netherlands Special Intervention Anti-Terrorism Unit also became involved. There were several uh, separate regular police reports, and the incident was so bad that the Royal Embassy of Saudi Arabia and several other embassies actually had to put a warning on their official embassy websites. Now, one thing you have to understand about an embassy is it is sovereign property of that particular country. Local laws do not apply whatsoever. You could witness a crime through the window occurring inside an embassy, and if you call the police, they will tell you there is nothing that can be done. Uh, the only people that have any sort of authority in that matter is actually the ambassador of that particular embassy. And uh, the diplomatic police have very, very, very limited jurisdiction, and in most cases it ref defers back to the ambassador. So the entire incident actually involved four major incidents. And it began with the email account hack. And we also found the first day that we came that there was a rootkit installed on the business portion of the embassy network. Now one thing to also consider is a lot of embassies around the world are also intelligence gathering stations. And 
we had to be very, very cautious which network we were actually doing a whole bunch of packet captures on because obviously the Saudi Arabian intelligence apparatus did not want us to see what was going on on the intelligence network. Uh, the extortion emails that came about rose all the way up to $50 million and over about 432 different dignitaries' lives were placed at risk because of this embassy attack. Now, this is the part where uh, this was not really reported in the media, the next couple of slides. Uh, the reason being is it involves a particular nation state. Now, one of our assessments were, and my assessment, was the malware that was used. It was a regular piece of malware that you could get basically like commercial off the shelf. Now, if you're a nation state and you use a unique tool, these tools cost millions sometimes to produce. And once they're used, they're burned forever. So in this particular case, we uh, highly suspected that the Iranian government had gotten the ISIS insider to use a commercial off the shelf for uh, plausible deniability. And uh, some of the reasons why we also suspected that the insider was being helped, even though he thought that he was an ISIS person, was because at the same time, our particular office in The Hague was being heavily surveilled by the Yemeni government. Now what had happened, this is actually a map of where I used to work, a Ramco overseas company in The Hague, and right next door was the embassy of Yemen. Now the building next door to us had been up for sale for probably about a year and a half because it was so expensive. And out of the blue, all of a sudden, even though we were not in the embassy section of The Hague, the Yemeni government bought with cash the entire building <laughs> next door. So we had suspected that the Iranian government had actually funded the entire embassy, and that was for very good reason. We also started having a lot of problems with the Yemen uh, embassy, and this is very problematic because, again, anything that happens at an embassy, does local laws do not regularly apply. So I'm standing in my boss's office, and he had a whole bunch of windows in the background, and um, he's sitting in his desk, and I'm looking out, and I happen to see a drone. And I will tell you, you will never forget the first time that you are droned, because the drone actually was launched by the Yemeni embassy. They were trying to surveil our building, and on the top floor was the IT section. Uh, also, uh, we had problems where we caught uh, Yemeni uh, embassy employees digging in the back of their property trying to access our fiber cable so that they could bend it and surveil it. Uh, we also caught several embassy employees coming into our building pretending to be employees in our canteen, in our cafeteria. And we even had an incident where uh, one of the embassy employees, uh, he had pulled out into the street and one of my uh, security analysts had pulled out in the street and the embassy official turned his car to the side, stopped it, and started yelling at one of my SOC analysts saying, I know who you are, stop following me. And the guy was just trying to go home. So we had had a lot of problems with the embassy already and a lot of suspect things and I had to write a, a rather lengthy report to give to uh, Saudi Aramco as to why uh, we were having so many problems and uh, they were a little surprised because in Saudi Arabia the compounds for Saudi Aramco are high security facilities. Some even have tanks, rocket launchers and so forth because they've actually come under physical attack. There have been several board members of Saudi Aramco who have either been assassinated or who have lived through uh, various assassination attempts. So it is not the typical company that most people work for, nor is it the typical national oil company either. Now, there were certain reasons why I was chosen for this particular task, because quite frankly, it's quite unusual for a non-Saudi national to lead an investigation of this sort at a Saudi embassy. Uh, 
I was already the head of the information protection group, which covered all the IT, IoT, and ICS for the entire MIA region outside of Saudi Arabia, and also I was responsible for Latin America. So I was in charge of the Network Operations Center, the Security Operations Center, and the Joint Intelligence uh, Group <coughs> for the company. Um, I had already had extensive experience with forensics and also my forensics person. I still think that he is the best forensics person I've ever seen in the entire world. And I, it was a true privilege to work with him. And I had already had a lot of experience uh, dealing with law enforcement uh, back and forth for various different types of incidents, whether that be uh, child pornography, human trafficking, illicit arms trafficking, and so forth. Um, I also do uh, various presentations to technical management all the way up to ministers and heads of state. So I don't just hand them a packet capture, even though most of us in this room will understand what's going on in a packet capture. They will just roll their eyes and go, why are you standing here with the packet capture? I can't even say the word correctly. Uh, another reason was because I am a U.S. citizen. At the time, there is a particular right-wing politician in the Netherlands called Hurt Wilders. And he had uh, previously made a video pretending to rip up the Quran, which caused a lot of worldwide uh, issues, um, especially in Muslim countries. And some of his activities really basically pissed off the Saudis to the point where Saudi Arabia at, this pre at the time of 2013 and 14 <laughs> had canceled all contracts with all Dutch companies and kicked out Dutch citizens out of the country, costing the Netherlands over a billion euros in contract losses, all because of one particular right-wing politician. Uh, so after day one, uh, my forensics person who was a Dutch citizen actually had to leave the incident and I had to handle everything from there going forward. So the first incident on the day that the very large gentleman uh, brought me from the lunchroom with spinach still in my teeth, I arrive at the embassy and there's a very, very nervous IT guy. Turns out it was his very first week and he had no handover from the previous person. And here he was going, we, we've, we've got our, our email hacked. Uh, okay, all right, uh, well, what was the password? And he's like, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I go, I excuse me? The, 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 this is an official embassy email account. No, well, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, I was not expecting that at an embassy. <laughs> and and I was also not expecting the fact that they were using, at the time, a residential internet connection with an outdated old residential modem that was attached to it. Uh, quite frankly, I thought that you would have to basically get a DNA test before you could access the computer systems, but I was completely wrong. And uh, the first series of suspicious emails that caught the embassy's attention uh, basically began with a $200 extortion attempt. <laughs> so there was a person by the name of Dr. Samayel Al Saouf who had asked for a visa. Now, she was not aware that the embassies around the world had stopped processing visas about a year and a half previous, and they had gone to a third party. And all of a sudden, she got this email back from the business email account saying, hey, we can expedite your visa if you send $200 to MoneyGram. Does anybody think MoneyGram is a legit place to get in a visa from? <laughs> yes, I see some thumbs up. Yeah, it was kind of strange, especially since it was only the ambassador's secretary who was uh, uh, supposed to have access to the business emails. And so Dr. Sumaya contacted the ambassador himself because they were friends and said, hey, what's going on with your secretary? I think she's just tried to get some money out of me. And he's like, what? Uh, an ambassador's secretary is usually probably the most trusted person in an embassy. So this was quite unusual and all of a sudden, hey, secretary's like, I've never sent that email. We don't even process uh, this kind of stuff. 
And what was also strange about uh, the first series of these suspect emails was the perpetrator tried to tie in Dr. Sumaya with the then ambassador of Saudi Arabia to the United Kingdom and was trying to infer somehow that they had an illicit uh, relationship, which they had not had ever. They actually barely knew each other. So we went ahead, we changed the password, we um, looked through all of the packets, we actually put on antivirus. At the time, they were only using something called Microsoft Essentials. <laughs> Microsoft Essentials lost its certification as an actual antivirus product back in like 19, or 2013. So we went ahead and installed some antivirus. We made a whole bunch of recommendations moving forward because there's only so much you can do in an embassy. You can make recommendations. And speaking with the ambassador so that he could understand exactly what was needed moving forward forward so this would not occur again. Now, we thought that it was over, and then about a week and a half, two weeks later, I'm trying to eat lunch again, and I will add, I barely ever was able to eat lunch at my work because it was always an incident. So same guy, same nice suit, I've come to summon you. There's been a problem, and I'm like, all right, either somebody died, they finally found out I was mining bitcoins, or <laughs> there's still an incident. Luckily, it was just the incident. But uh, yeah, uh, it was a bit of a problem. So I went back to the embassy and was like, hey, you know, what, what, what's up? What's going on? And it turns out that uh, they, a person signing an email of ISIS sent a $25,000 extortion demand to the embassy of Saudi Arabia, all the rest of what's called the GCC nations, and to the country of Turkey, their embassy in The Hague as well. And what was going on was it was starting to really damage the embassy's reputation because suddenly the other embassies realized that here this email was coming from the official business email of the embassy of Saudi Arabia signed by ISIS that they could save many lives and this was potentially quite embarrassing. Now unfortunately I'm sure that a lot of us have done this before. How many of us have done CC instead of BCC? Right? Well unfortunately um, the diplomatic police were trying to be very proactive and so after the $25,000 extortion attempts via email, uh, they actually sent an email to all of the back channel uh, emails in The Hague to the embassies and said, hey, if you get any of these emails, go ahead and send them to us. But they used CC and unfortunately they did not realize that the attackers were still on the network. And this is actually um, the email sanitized of the extortion attempts that were sent to the GCC countries and to Turkey. Uh, luckily, a few of the countries were very cooperative and actually allowed us to collect evidence uh, directly from their systems and give us that evidence so that we could look at it to see if there was any difference, if it came from different headers, from the emails, whatever it might be. Now, when the diplomatic police did their little CC instead of BCC, unfortunately, because the perpetrators still had access to the email system, they sent a reply all back to the diplomatic police and to all the embassies and said, hey, how's everybody? I'm glad I got your attention. We're going to start raising up the price to everyone. And this is when things started to turn weird and ugly. So the perpetrator then broke into the ambassador secretary's personal email Gmail account and started sending extortion demands directly to her and threatening her. This was very unfortunate because it scared the living hell out of her. And so she immediately went to the local police saying, hey, you know, I, I think my life's in danger. 
I, I'm getting extortion attempts up to $35 million from ISIS and they've broken into my email account. What can I do? And uh, unfortunately, uh, on the behest of the ambassador, uh, we went ahead and had those police reports closed. Uh, at the time, we did not want things to be too public. And so the extortion attempts went up, and it began to look to us more and more like it was something of a very personal nature that was going on. And this isn't, say, uh, typical of an outsider doing an attack, but more like an insider. We also began to suspect various people as well inside the embassy and inside other embassies. Finally, the uh, perpetrator uh, threatened to blow up a national landmark in the country of the Netherlands. There is a place called the Kerr House. It used to be the place where very wealthy people would stay before they went on these cruises before they had airplanes back in the day. And it's located at this place, if I can say it correctly in Dutch, Scheveningen, uh, which is a very famous Dutch beach area in The Hague. And the perpetrator was aware of the fact that there was going to be a big celebration there called National Saudi Day, where over 400 dignitaries and their high-level staff were invited to. So we're talking about the ambassador from Japan, the ambassador from the US, and so forth. And what they said was, if you don't give us now 50 million, we're going to blow it up. And we'll make sure that everyone is dead. This is when the Dutch terrorism police began to get involved for obvious reasons because it involved a landmark and also very solid death threats against a lot of very, very important people, including some Dutch royalty who had been invited. Now, here's where the incident took a very, very strange turn. Um, I used to frequent a pub in The Hague uh, called Sherlock's, which oddly enough was voted the best British pub in the Netherlands. Don't know how they got that one, but it was very British pub style. And I liked it because it was within walking distance, about two minutes from my house, and this was kind of a stressful investigation, so I like beer. Uh, also rakia for later, after I finish speaking, right? And there were three individuals there one day who were waiting there, and they'd been waiting there, I was told, by the owner for several hours sipping tea, asking directly about me and when I usually came in. So I came in, and here were these three individuals, and they were from the Turkish embassy of The Hague. They gave me their business card as well, and all three of them were cultural attaches of the embassy of Turkey. And what was strange about this, firstly, I was not expecting to get a visit from Turkish intelligence. Secondly, they spoke pretty good English and said that they were waiting for me, a person that they didn't know, a complete stranger, and were asking if I would give them English lessons. <laughs> right? No offense to the Turkish government, but I'm sure I won't be able to visit there anytime soon now. I, uh, I like to refer them to them as the dumb, dumber, and dumbest intelligence agents I have ever run into in my entire life. So um, I was advised and reported the incident to kind of keep them busy uh, to a certain extent in the evenings with these English lessons that they uh, so desperately needed. And uh, it was also at this time that I was advised by various security services that they had found my name on a list where I was a high value target for kidnap on a top 10 list by ISIS. So at this time I was also assigned some loose protection uh, and close personal protection to keep an eye on me, especially when I was meeting with these cultural attaches. <laughs> And what was even a bit odder was the main, more senior uh, attache gave me a very interesting gift. I did have it thoroughly checked. It's still at my house. Uh, there was nothing electronic in it. Uh, and they let me keep it after they searched it all. Um, he, I'm not Muslim, 
but he gave me a uh, set of very nice prayer beads which is an unusual gift to give a non-Muslim and especially a woman that you do not know or are not related to. So um, if you ever get gifts from a foreign intelligence agent, always have it checked. And then if it's okay afterwards, see if they'll let you keep it. So more and more we started suspecting an insider. There was a uh, very personal attacks against the ambassador's secretary. There was inside knowledge that only people inside the Saudi Arabian embassy would or should know. Uh, also at this time, uh, the ambassador did something rather unusual. He actually allowed me to take embassy, uh, an embassy system to my house because previously it was everybody looking over my shoulder and it was very difficult as a non-citizen to be able to do an incident investigation in this manner. So after I brought a laptop home, within about 15 minutes and half a glass of wine, I realized that the perpetrator was still inside the email account because on the back end, uh, the perpetrator had actually set up an email forwarding system. And so once that was found, uh, we began to search further. The perpetrator then, once uh, they were kicked out of the email system, uh, began then sending emails with the same extortion attempts, $50 million, to, uh, via Yandex accounts and a few other email accounts outside the country of the Netherlands. We began uh, collecting evidence and trying to look at the different hops and then using diplomatic means, because we did not want to have a court order from uh, the Dutch authorities to do this type of action, and uh, through diplomacy attempted to uh, contact all of the different countries who were on these hops to get them to give us additional information. Now, at the same time, the two key suspects that the ambassador himself uh, were very suspicious of, uh, one evening after everybody had left the embassy, except for the ambassador, myself, and his uh, bodyguards, we began, and this was even odder, almost like a, a very strange television show, him and I got on our hands and knees and were sifting through dusty bits to try to look for post-it notes and credentials and anything basically we could to get into the two suspects' computer systems. I'd never imagined that an ambassador would, you know, get on his hands and knees and do any of that. So um, the perpetrator kind of messed up. And I was able to use a couple of the hops to pinpoint to a neighborhood in The Hague where the then primary suspect uh, had actually lived. And it was at that time where we also had discussions. The uh, primary suspect did have diplomatic immunity. And like many embassies in the world, in order to work at an embassy, you have to be usually pretty educated, know at least French and a few other languages, but you're usually from a very high up family. So this was the case with this particular individual. Uh, this person could not just be sent back to Saudi Arabia because of this situation. So instead, uh, there was a decision to be made about what to do to the individual. Now, I do want to stress, we never paid any sort of extortion, not a single penny. Um, we also made sure that the location uh, and coordination with the uh, terrorism police was safe and very secure for that particular event. And unfortunately for the primary suspect, he was uh, very quickly reassigned to an extremely physically dangerous location somewhere in the world. And within his first couple of weeks of being there, unfortunately, there was a car bomb. No one else was hurt. It was only him. So sad. So after the incident was solved, after the perpetrator was neutralized, I got a few rewards. 
And at the farewell dinner of the ambassador, because he had been there for about five years, so it's a very long stretch for an ambassadorship, um, held a private dinner with a bunch of dignitaries and so forth uh, at a place called the Rijksmuseum, which holds the most famous Dutch painting in Dutch culture called The Night Watchman. And it's uh, so influential with uh, the Dutch and the Dutch psyche that inside the Constitution, the Dutch Constitution, it states that only a Dutch person can ever own it. And this thing is huge. I had never seen it before. I had seen the Mona Lisa, which is like that big. And it's like a conveyor belt trying to see it in the museum but it was huge. And so they rented out the museum and we actually uh, had dinner in front of this Night Watchman painting, which was really kick-ass, to be honest with you. Uh, unfortunately, I was a bit sick that night, so I couldn't have any of the posh wine, but I could smell it. <laughs> and I was given a gift by the ambassador in front of the rest of the dignitaries, which was rather cool, I must say. I still have that one. So I, I did enjoy the dinner, even though I was not feeling well. So there are a few things that I learned from this particular incident. And a lot of them deal with geopolitics. Now, many of us in security, we think, hey, here's this bug. Here's this web application vulnerability. Here's this problem with the network switch. We need to get things up and running. But rarely are we ever faced with, uh-oh, is this a geopolitical situation that we've stepped into? Uh, usually uh, the only types of people who have to deal with that are telecom uh, providers or computer emergency response teams or unique type of companies like Saudi Aramco. Um, another thing that I learned was the fact that an incident from a 123456 password on an email system which still blows my mind, uh, can actually lead to real human consequences and involve multiple governments. And that's one thing to actually consider. A very small, quote unquote, hack can actually end up in the long run killing people. And it was one of those uh, facing reality of the situation events. And I've, I've, it's changed my mindset ever since. Another thing, like I said, if you ever give wonderful gifts from foreign agents, be very wary. Um, I'm currently working with the Federal Bureau of Investigation on a case because the Iranian government for the past three and a half years has been trying to recruit me. And uh, they have offered me up to 100,000 euro to spend one month in the country of Iran to teach them offensive critical infrastructure security with a focus on nuclear uh, facilities. And uh, with the offer, they even said that they would take me on a VVIP tour around the country, shaking hands, propaganda, pictures with uh, various generals and so forth. I highly doubt that I would ever come back. Unfortunately, in January, uh, the Dutch government uh, revealed that the Iranian government had actually ordered two contract killings inside the country of the Netherlands, and it was at this time that they also asked for my home address so that they could send me a gift. Uh, I'm no longer in contact with them uh, per the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation's instructions. And uh, it, it, it's very unusual. I, I, trust me, I, I could have used that, that 100,000 euro for one month's work. But uh, no, I, I would have never been able to come back. Um, I'm a target for them because they know that I work for Saudi Aramco. They are not particularly friendly with Saudi Aramco. And they know that I have a lot of information that they would like, um, but I don't want to ever spend time in an Iranian or US jail cell. Neither of them sound very nice. Another thing that I learned was because I'm ex-military, I've done a lot of very interesting and unusual things, which sometimes can be nice, sometimes can be quite dangerous. And when you're inside um, an organization like that, or you're uh, in that mindset where you're dealing with an incident that actually poses real danger, uh, I did not tell uh, my partner at the time what was going on because I figured it was better not to scare them. 
Uh, so I highly uh, uh, recommend you actually do that because obviously if you're a high value target, then that particular terrorist organization can use the closest hops next to you to uh, get to you and use against you. Uh, the last thing you want is your parents, your children, your spouse being kidnapped uh, so that you are uh, forced to do something that you don't want to do. Uh, I finally told my partner about two years later. I will say that was an interesting discussion to have. Um, <clears throat> I'm not saying there was yelling, but there was some yelling. So it's a good idea to uh, make them aware and also uh, have them report back if they see any sort of unusual activities as well in case that they're being followed in any way or form. And another thing that I've learned, and I think that this comes from my military background, is when you're faced with a very major incident, the last thing you should do is panic. Because the rest of the organization will be panicking, uh, especially management. They're the ones that seem to panic the most. And you have to calm that chaos, especially when it involves human lives or major markets or something that can shake up the world because just take a deep breath or it can absolutely be the last time or it can actually cost real human lives. So I've tried to time this so that I could take a few questions from the audience about this particular incident and also keep on time for the next speaker. So uh, I would like to thank Balcon for picking this talk and also having me the keynote and give a special shout out to a couple of organizations. That's her Twitter account uh, who actually reviewed the slides with me and helped me out. So I am ready to take a few questions if you don't mind. I can't, I can't hey. hear you. Hey, much better, I think. Were there ever any uh, regrets or questions concerning the de facto murder without a trial? And is, is that common in an embassy? Um, I don't know if it was murder without a trial. I will say that um, the place that the person was sent to, it was already a well-known uh, high security risk where several other embassy uh, employees from different embassies had actually been kidnapped or killed in that particular country. So it was, um, we used to have in the US Air Force this place called Thule Greenland that if you screwed up really badly, you would be sent to. And this was one of those you screwed up really badly and this is not a safe location to send someone to. So I've got a question up in the front. So what happened with these three Turkish uh, intelligent guys after English lessons? <laughs> so it, it was kind of strange because uh, the senior guy actually started renting a room uh, right beside the pub and uh, told me part of his life story, which may or may not have been true. And after about a two and a half week time period of dealing with the Turkish intelligence, uh, they suddenly left the country and I was informed by security services that they had actually left the country of the Netherlands completely, all three of them. And what was a bit odd was after my uh, DEF CON Sky Talks, uh, there was a guy who was former military in Turkey, and he said that he had actually been assigned three Turkish agents, and they were also dumb, dumb, and dumber. <laughs> and <laughs> around that time zone, a time frame, and we were kind of wondering if they were actually the same people because they weren't very, uh, very good, unfortunately. So I'm not sure. I have a question over here. Um, the, the present you got during the fancy dinner in front in, in the Rijksmuseum, did you get that checked as well? Yes, I did. <laughs> yes, I did. I always check gifts from foreign governments, no matter how nice or pretty they're gift wrapped. Yes, absolutely. Don't trust anyone, except me. <laughs> All right, I've got a question over here. 
Okay, so if I understand correctly, in the end, the main purpose of this intrusion was PR, right? Well, we saw that it was trying to damage the reputation. And at the same time, we highly suspected that the perpetrator thought that they were actually with ISIS, uh, but were most likely not. Uh, so I think that it was one of those cases where the perpetrator's religious views were more towards ISIS versus Saudi Arabia religious reviews. reviews. Um, there's been a lot of ISIS-related terrorist attacks inside the country of Saudi Arabia uh, repeatedly, including um, there's one area of Saudi Arabia that's been off limits for quite some time because of kidnapping. And there's been a lot of discussions uh, between Wahhabism in Saudi and the belief that that is not strict enough uh, with uh, various ISIS people. So I think it was, in Saudi culture, uh, one of the worst things you can do is embarrass someone or embarrass a company. And I think that that was what it was aimed for. Okay, thank you. Uh, when you said you used the diplomatic uh, connections to find the headers of emails from various countries. What was the time frame that you received help from those? We, really, we received some help from some countries and we started putting the word out and uh, within about a week and a half we got some information. Some governments like Russia laughed at us uh, <laughs> because uh, they were not too friendly with Saudi Arabia at the time. And some countries didn't actually respond. And we found out later that oh, some of those countries didn't actually have functioning computer emergency response teams. They might have had a website. Um, like the Tanzania one um, has a website, but they're actually misusing the trademark because they're not a registered cert. Um, so we ran into those problems. And that, that's, that, that's unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. There's got to be more questions. There is Did I hear Rakia leaks? <laughs> I see one in the back. Oh, thank you, sweetie. Okay, dokie. Thanks a lot for really interesting talk, and uh, quite entertaining one. So, uh, when are you delivering us English lessons? <laughs> <laughs> you want some English lessons? <laughs> buy me some. Buy me a beer afterwards. I'll give you some English lessons. <laughs> uh, but on the serious note, uh, there are a lot of uh, oil-rich uh, countries that are all less developed than Saudi Arabia. Let's say. Do you have some kind of statistics, or maybe just gut feeling? How often this happens? Uh, actually, it happens, or very, very serious incidents like this happen on a near daily basis with some Middle Eastern countries. I was speaking with a friend associated with, uh, we'll say, electronic warfare uh, with one of the militaries, and he had just come back from Saudi dealing with their now new computer emergency response team because they instituted one about a year, year and a half ago finally. And he basically said that he was really impressed with them because what they face on a weekly basis, most people don't face for a lifetime in this particular field. And it's happening constantly. Uh, in the Middle East, they have suffered a lot of physical terrorist attacks that you don't hear so much in the news. And what happens as well as when some of these terrorist groups, because there's quite a few, find out that um, someone is working for one of these organizations, then they also target their family. So it's a very dangerous but very, very serious situation. And they're dealing with trying to surveil individuals who definitely have explosives and arms and plans to carry out various attacks. So it's quite serious in the Middle East. Um, after that really bad passwords, like one, two, three, four, five, six, did they uh, take some actions afterwards? 
Yes, absolutely. Um, they had had a lot of problems. Uh, it wasn't just the password. It's like their entire rack system was in a um, hallway that anybody could walk into and tap into, and the camera was faced away, and that was also a problem. Uh, so there were a bevy of problems, and I think uh, the recommendation report uh, was something like 25 pages with what equipment to buy, the budget they needed, the people to put it in, and so forth. Because uh, what had happened there, they definitely did not want it to happen on the intelligence apparatus portion of the network. Luckily, that one was completely isolated with various uh, completely different connections. And what was also interesting was when you're dealing with an ambassador, and you're making a recommendation report, you can't uh, write it in the phrase of you know better. So it had to be written very, very carefully with very nice words and pleasant words to basically coax and get uh, the ambassador and his staff to understand without coming off as uh, somebody who knew better. So yes, they, they made drastic changes. And I can tell you, it's no longer one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? <laughs> yeah, no, they didn't add seven to it. <laughs> oh, I heard that. <laughs> I've got one here and one there. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks as well. Um, do you know whether the embassies of Saudi Arabia, for, for instance, um, have the same, let's say, security measurements all over the world, or are they completely isolated and, and different from each other? Uh, they, they can be very different from each other. And also that's down to, at the time, Saudi Arabia did not have a lot of uh, people and resources to deal with uh, regular IT or any sort of IT security issues. That's because at the time, up until last year, they did not actually have any sort of cyber security degree program in the entire country of Saudi Arabia. So that's very problematic. The top study was in petroleum and petroleum engineering because it's an oil rich state. Um, now, uh, the person who's, I felt so bad for him, uh, whose first week it was, uh, he uh, was a very nice gentleman but had gotten the position because he was from a very high up family and didn't really have a lot of experience. He certainly gained a lot of experience after this entire thing. <laughs> uh, a crash course, so to speak. Uh, yes, but they can be very different. And also after this particular incident, uh, every embassy of Saudi Arabia uh, then went under, under a review view uh, for their security uh, on their business side and on their intelligence side. Got another question? Who had the mic? Yeah, I have a mic uh, for a ah. qu quick question here. Uh, so uh, was the, how was the local intelligence agency for the, uh, that the Netherlands, Dutch, uh, how, were they happy for you snooping around the local foreign embassy network? Maybe they thought you might find something else there, so uh, maybe something they left there or something like that? They, they were fine, which probably indicates that they had not left anything there. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, uh, and they probably didn't need to <laughs> because of, at the time, the very weak security that was going on. Uh, all emails, the business emails were in clear text, for example. There was no encryption. So they didn't really have to do much. Uh, all they had to do was connect into the telecommunications infrastructure and get everything that they needed. Don't make it easy for spies. Unless they're your spies, right? Do I have any more questions? I've got a, a few more minutes. It's got to be one, maybe two. I feel like an auctioneer bidder. I see a hand. Yes, save by hand. So uh, other than the uh, weak password and the lack of you know, proper antivirus and things like that. Is there anything um, easily that could have avoided uh, things like this or just anything like that that you run into that uh, people could easily avoid? Um, 
Um, one thing would have been if they had recognized that they needed a actual digital security person to handle an embassy network. Um, I, there's a difference between your day-to-day -day IT and your day-to-day -day digital security. And they had never done a risk assessment. They didn't even realize that they needed to do anything like that. Um, they were not aware that they needed to patch things, and, nor were they aware that you had to uh, lock down physical access to systems and to the network infrastructure because it's so easy to tap into different things. So they really needed a digital security person, not just a regular IT person for the day-to-day -day keeping things running. And that's one thing that every bit of this could have been easily avoided. One more question. What was the biggest IT misunderstanding on their side you encountered while you did this uh, incident management? Well, they kind of assumed, uh, and this was a very, very poor assumption, that everything on the business network, it wasn't all that important, and they also assumed that some people from their intelligence network would advise them, but the two did not work together. Uh, they were not the same, they did not have the same goals, and they had different reporting functions. So the intelligence apparatus reported directly to Saudi Arabia, as in many cases in an embassy, not directly to the ambassador. So they had a lot of assumptions, and they also didn't think that they would ever be targeted. I have no idea where they got that idea after the Saudi Aramco Shamoon attacks, but they had this in their head. So unfortunately, any of us can be a target. Another question for me: uh, What was the biggest motivation for ambassador to get into to get into to the Nice? Because you know, normally, because you said he was also looking with you with the uh, post-its and something. Because normally, we know that from Saudi Arabia, you know, they don't easily get to the Nice and try to help you. So, what was the uh, uh, motivation for for him, or how did you persuade him to to do that? Or he actually d started doing it himself. And that, that was very strange, but I think it was the desperate situation that uh, himself, uh, his friends, and his family were uh, at direct risk because the perpetrator had also uh, given information about the Kerr house, for example, and things that made it extra super creepy and very, very viable. Uh, in the past, there have been functions uh, like the National Saudi Day, which uh, terrorists have actually killed people and blown up the buildings. So he was faced with the situation where the closest people to him were at direct risk. And the fact that if something like that happened on Saudi National Day, that would have been a big blow to Saudi Arabia itself. So he actually started getting down on his knees, and at first I didn't know what he was doing. So it was a very strange situation and something I don't think I'll ever see again. Sometimes uh, risk of your family and your friends will get you to do very interesting things. Uh, are there any more questions? Got one more? And one more there. How, hi, Chris. How did you stay not to be a paranoid when you were dealing with the whole situation, maintaining the mindset, without thinking the Turkish are behind me or there may be, you know, trying to steal my phone or doing some crazy stuff? Um, this is uh, something that I don't uh, regularly talk about, but in the past, because of some previous work, I had been uh, kidnapped and held hostage, and uh, it was not a pleasant situation. And after that situation, and with a lot more military training and so forth, uh, I was able to ground myself by documenting as much as possible because writing things down keeps you grounded. Also reading things like a playbook do as well. And uh, realize that um, at anything that I had could be under surveillance. So it was one of these things where uh, I, I even thought that at times most likely my house was being surveilled from the inside. So I took various precautions to do so. 
and just tried to stay grounded as much as possible because I knew that people were actually physically watching me, so I wasn't too afraid of somebody kidnapping me at this point. Or it could have been the adrenaline. I don't know. Hi. Thank Hello. you for the amazing talk. I just wanted to ask you, were you ever... Uh, how paranoid were you when the about ISIS hurting someone, you or your loved one? And was there a particular moment that you were afraid for your life? Um, I wasn't too paranoid that they would uh, affect, at the time, my, my one bit of family, which was good. But there were several occasions where I knew that my life was definitely at risk. And uh, so I updated things like my will, my uh, like power of attorney in case I was injured, and if somebody had to make medical decisions for me. And it was one of those cases where it wasn't like getting this devastating news you have cancer, but it's one of these, holy crap, tomorrow I might get hit by a bus and it might be driven by an intelligence agent, whoops. So it gave me an opportunity for the first time in many years to actually update all this stuff. So, yes, there were a few times where I definitely thought that my life was at risk. Any more? All right. So, my time is up. Uh, I will start packing up. Thank you so much, Balcon, and everyone for attending. I thoroughly enjoyed it.